Hi, I'm Paul Dickerson and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. Today, Russ Capper sits down with Dr. Michael Economides, the very straightforward global energy expert with a PhD in petroleum engineering from Stanford, an author of 15 books and professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at the University of Houston. All that right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Makers Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Makers Show. Welcome back to the Energy Makers Show. My guest now, Dr. Michael Economides, PhD in Petroleum Engineering from Stanford, a global energy consultant, an expert in the geopolitics of energy, an author of 15 books now, and also professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at the University of Houston. Michael, welcome to the Energy Maker Show. Thank you very much. Let's start here. Here we are, first quarter of 2013, and the energy outlook in the United States is incredible. In fact, I can't understand why we're not having a national celebration. We should, actually. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's been about 20 years now that I had a thought, and uh, I articulated it a couple of times. And I'm not sure I have a, it has a, enough traction, okay? So, okay. Um, my thought has been that energy and energy abundance should actually be the most populist of all issues. It should be a democratic issue. It should not be delegated to the right-wing fringes of the Republican Party, okay, like some people are thinking. Uh, it shouldn't be any different than the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat, okay? I always tell people, look, if you take the energy industry worldwide, you bunch it all together. Um, the oil and gas industry, not just, you know, the term energy means silly things, oh, like yeah. solar and wind and so on. Right, right. Let's, uh, let's talk about the oil industry, oil right, and gas. Right. You put them together, it's the biggest economic entity other than the United States. So in other words, think of Exxon as one of the 20 largest countries in the world, okay? That's, that's the size of it, all right? And so you look at the energy industry and you say, my God, how much more do you want? I mean, you have millions of jobs depending on the oil industry. The other uh, day, somebody calculated for me that petroleum technology is a, something like a $20 billion a year export industry, technology, okay? I'm talking about well, tubulars right now, tools, uh, drilling rigs. Uh, technology. Technology yeah. in general. So, yeah. I mean, that's a huge asset. So all of these things, yes, should be cause for enormous celebration. Right. And yet you have this, uh, this almost hate relationship towards the industry from large segments of the population, by the way. Yeah. It's hard for me to figure it out. Because incidentally, this doesn't happen in any other country. Wow. You exclude maybe France uh, and okay, some segments in Australia that I, I studied this phenomenon. You look at every other country, the energy industry is the pride and joy. Let's take Brazil. Work for Pedro Braz is a marquee thing, okay? People in your neighborhood think you are a hero. Okay, I mean, you're somebody to emulate, okay? You are an engineer for Petrobras, my right. God. Um, in China, I mean, you're a national hero to be the vice president of CNOOC, right. Chinese National Offshore Oil Company. Right. I mean, they, are, they recognize the importance that energy plays in the life of the country. I wonder sometime if here in the United States, the general population doesn't understand the importance of energy in the economy, it drives it. Well, completely. maybe this is an, another example of why the energy has been so so successful to make you think that it's not there. Right, right. You enter the room, you flip the switch, and in the United States, lights will come on. Every time. Okay, every time. 
There is reliability involved. Right. There is energy. Well, it seems like even in this category of things to celebrate, it seems like at least the fact that CO2 emissions, I mean, from the environmentalists, CO2 emissions are down significantly yeah. now. Why, can't, why, can't, why didn't that come to the front page of the Look, newspaper? I think this is nonsense, a lot of this stuff. But nevertheless, let's even for a moment assume that everything they are talking about is right. Okay. That there is, there is CO2 connection with climate change, and it's all, most of it anthropogenic, man, man created, and so on. Let's, let's, give, let's suppose that. Okay. First of all, can we do anything about it? <laughs> In other words, I always ask people, look, does anybody on this earth really believe that there will be economically extractable hydrocarbons on, the, on this earth that will not be produced because somehow we pass carbon tax legislation in Washington, D.C., or Canberra, Australia? I mean, how silly can you get? I mean, you have China, you have India, they're going to use every, and we have only one atmosphere. Right. I mean, come on. So that's one thing. Then the, the CO2, the whole idea of carbon dioxide was so, uh, it was the glove that fit. You remember, the, if it doesn't the fit, fit, you should must not convict. Yes, yes. Now these gloves fit very, yeah. very well. Right. I mean, there is no evidence in any of this stuff. You know, right. There is no scientific. It's all nonsense. I mean, for example, most of the things that Gore has been saying and all these guys, there is no scientific evidence for any of this stuff at all. In other words, direct scientific evidence. There is circumstantial evidence. There is, uh, and by the way, I'm a scientist. I certainly believe there is a connection between greenhouse gases and temperature. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to think that there mm -hmm. is not. But this amount of CO2 just doesn't make any sense to affect laws. I'm gonna bore you, like the, uh, the Stefan Boltzmann law, for example, mm -hmm. which is the law of radiation, heat transfer. It just, I tried hard to find some scientific, real evidence, okay, where links discernible laws of, of thermodynamics or heat transfer and so on, and I teach this stuff, okay? So in other words, it's not something that I am uh, a skeptic on television or right. something like that. I mean, I try to find out what's going on. It just doesn't exist, okay? Now, they do have statistical evidence. They measure temperatures, and of course, they attribute all of that to anthropogenic CO2. I mean, it goes something like this. The temperature goes up, CO2 goes up, the one must cause the other, okay? Of course, the other way could be the opposite also, mm -hmm. that is, as the temperature goes up, CO2 also goes up, you see what I mean? But that is something they don't... Right, occur. consider, the, yeah. The cause and effect, in other words, may right. be reversed. Right, Okay, which, by the way, there is some evidence for that also. Okay. So the, the jury is clearly out. What is definitely not the case is the outrageous numbers that people have suggested. That, that will never happen, okay? That in other words, we're gonna have temperature increases or sea level increases that Gore suggested. And of course, you know, liberal Hollywood gave him the Oscar for that, <laughs> which is pretty much figment of his imagination. I mean, there is no evidence that we're gonna have 20 foot seas for instance, right. things like that. Right. Come on, give me a break. Right. I, mean, I want to make people to understand that when I'm railing against CO2, that does not mean I'm not an environmentalist. I am an environmentalist for sure, and I can tell you this much, that coal, no matter what people say, is decidedly dirtier than natural gas by a long shot, mm -hmm. okay? I'm talking about particulates, you know, mm -hmm. ash, in other words, mm -hmm. that comes out. Unless you collect all that ash, it's gonna end up like China, okay? You look at China, 15 of the 20 most polluted cities in the world are in China because they don't control their coal particulates mm -hmm. emissions, mm -hmm. not the CO2, okay? Mm -hmm. And there is also NOx and SOx, these are well-established mm -hmm. things. Nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, mm -hmm. this is acid rain. Mm -hmm. All of these things, if not taken into account, will precipitate problems, okay? We understand that. Uh, breathing problems, uh, visual problems, the sky is just a smog, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and uh, certainly all of these things are very real issues that, in fact, natural gas is the obvious answer. All right, we'll be back with more with Dr. Michael Economides after this. At BKD, we understand the constantly shifting nature of the energy industry. 
As a national CPA and advisory firm, we serve energy clients from the beginning to the end of the cycle. Our experienced energy advisors serve approximately 300 energy companies in exploration, midstream, downstream, oil field services, and power production. Plus, we're the largest North American member of the Praxity Global Alliance, which means we can help you wherever you operate. Contact a BKD advisor or visit us online to learn more. This is the Energy Makers Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Makers Show. Welcome back to the Energy Maker Show, continuing on with Dr. Michael Economides. Okay, so an interesting thing too, though, uh, about our sudden abundance uh, of natural gas, it it does have some pretty significant geopolitical ramifications, does it not? No doubt, and I've written about this extensively. Let me let me just dissect some of these issues for you. First of all, the production of natural gas from shale mm-hmm. is arguably the biggest and best story in the history of, of the American oil and gas business the last 50 years. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, no doubt about that. I mean, this is an extraordinary feat. Um, going back to my high box that I am preaching right now is that this is again, the now use the same word, the quintessentially American character uh, the can-do attitude, innovation, uh, private industry taking the lead, letting the economy function as it does without government interference. You put all of these things together, truly shale gas should be one of the best stories, not just energy stories, Mm -hmm. but one of the best stories that an American would be proud of. Okay, in other words, uh, it's great application of technology, great economic decision making, great can do Mm -hmm. attitude, put a lot of these things, the accolades are just endless, okay, of what happened. The end result is that suddenly we have found natural gas in the world, and by the way, the International Energy Agency responded to this, it stunned even me in November 2010, when they doubled their expected ultimate recovery for natural gas from 15,000 TCF to 30,000 TCF, all thanks to U.S. shale. That's f- incredible. Never had a story like this before, mm-hmm. by the way. Mm-hmm. So in one year, they doubled just by watching what's happening in the United States and extrapolating. The bottom line for most people is this, that right now we have gas for 300 years. Okay, so there goes at shambles this whole idea we're running out of hydrocarbons. Right. Oil is expanding also dramatically, shale oil, similar technologies, kind of different application, okay, but pretty much similar to the, to most people. Um, to the point that every estimate right now suggests that the United States will surpass Saudi Arabia and Russia as the world's largest producer of oil. I mean, what a dramatic turnaround, okay, from what we thought we were. Absolutely. And and you have gas right now that is so enormous. And by the way, I'm gonna, let me give you a little secret, which I've been telling people recently. You know, there is something called natural gas hydrates, Mm -hmm. which is frozen natural gas. Uh, You find it in the bottom of oceans, in the bottom of permafrost uh, layers and things like that. If we access that, and I'm beginning to think, wearing my technical hat right now, that the technology that we use for shale oil can actually be relatively easy transformed into the technology to go after shale gas with some major modifications. In this, in this hydrate? In this class? hydrate, yeah. yes. Suddenly we have natural gas for 10,000 years. <laughs> Not 300, right. 10,000, right. okay? And that is the same kind of technology, mul- horizontal walls with multiple fractures, the kind of things that we know how to do. Okay? Right. So, so in other words, we are talking about right now an industry, I always tell people, look, the future of oil and gas is not solar and wind. The future of oil and gas is oil and gas. Right. Okay, and it's gonna last for centuries. I don't know what the hell we're talking about. 
President Obama, in his uh, inaugural address, uh, seemed to once again reemphasize uh, renewables after sure. after I thought he was a uh, for all yeah. different kinds, all in. And h how do you interpret that? The irony in, in Obama's situation is that in his watch, we have this avalanche of evolutions of natural gas, and the guy, I mean, I, sometimes I feel sorry for him because, you know, his, his cerebral self surely tells him how stupid it is to be spending money on solar and wind, you know, <laughs> when you have all this natural gas sitting around and ready to be produced with your own people. It's not like, it's not like some foreign brigade showed up and showed us something. It's not like we do in other countries where we go over there and we produce some of this oil and gas right. and, you know, the hell with the locals sometimes right. and things like that. I mean, these your own guys are producing gas here. It's not like they want to produce gas in... Jamaica and they brought it here. Right. It's in, right. in Texas, it generates jobs, good jobs. I mean, the energy industry is no question generates the best paying jobs. Let me shock you a little bit. From my university, a BS in petroleum engineering right now starts at a hundred thousand dollars a year. That's nice. It's a twenty-one year old kid. Okay, yeah. I want people to realize that we are not just BSing over here. Okay, <laughs> I mean. You realize my colleagues at the university are envious because senior full professors in some departments don't make a hundred grand, okay? <laughs> and my students, even C students are getting jobs right now for $90,000 a year. But are we, are we gonna be in some, some near-term difficult political waters uh, based on Obama's attitude and the, the fact that the Democrats control the executive branch in the Senate and the fact that the EPA is investigating and the fact that even Yoko Ono uh, doesn't think that uh, hydraulic fracturing is a good thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Yoko Ono right now is an expert on <laughs> yes. hydraulic fracturing. Yes. It's really funny. Yes. I mean, or uh, Daryl Hannah. You That's, know? Right. That's right. I mean, give me a break. I mean, <laughs> we've been fracking since... 1949, okay? I okay. Mean, personally, I'm a liberal myself, you know? Socially, I'm as liberal as you can get. In mm -hmm. other words, I don't care, for example, who marries whom, I don't care about uh, abortion. None of these issues has I ever worried about. You right. understand what I mean? Right. So I, I'm as liberal and democrat as you can get. And for sure, I'm not a fundamentalist of anything. You know right. what I mean? Okay. But looking at reality, real life, I mean, look at what's happening here. The energy industry is the best job maker bar none. Millions of jobs have been created in Obama's watch on energy, whereas all his other Kaganimi ideas are job losses. Right. So, I mean, eventually, you know, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck, okay? I mean, you can pretend it's a turkey or whatever, but... He's a duck. <laughs> and so you're saying there's no way he can stop this. There is no way out of it. In yeah. other words, yeah. it's not really that they can do something to harm it. I mean, they, they can try and, they, and uh, they can have the oil industry taxed so that they can do their pet idea, pet ideas, you know, things like right. that. It's going to be a little more expensive to buy oil in that case. Okay, they're going to be right. rhetoric. People are going to be talking. But the industry is so massive, is so successful. It's so f into the future, okay, that there is, it just, there is, it is dwarfs, I mean, all this stuff around them. I mean. <laughs> Michael, I really appreciate you sharing your perspective with us. Sure. That's Dr. Michael Economides, and that wraps up this episode of the Energy Maker Show, heard on the radio and seen online at theenergymakers.com.